Yeah, well, welcome everybody to tonight's Horse Tribe webinar. I'm here and above me tonight, we have else for you is Heidi. Um, and our mission is to find wonderful people like Simon and bring them to you and let you hear their incredible work and their incredible ideas. So we'll get pretty much straight on and introduce Simon, but first of all, quick touch. I did that thing with mute on. Just a really quick um, slide on the tech. Um, I'm sure most of you have used Zoom, have used Zoom before, um, but just in case you haven't, um, or just so you know what we're doing tonight, um, on your screen you should have three icons at the bottom of the screen, uh, the chat, raise hand and Q&A. Um, tonight, if you could use the Q&A to ask questions, that would be brilliant. We're gonna look there for all of the questions. Um, and if we have similar ones, we'll be able to sort of group them together and so on. Um, if you want to speak your question rather than type it, then just raise your hand and we'll be able to unmute you. You can actually ask question, Simon your question yourself. Um, feel free to type the questions at any point. Um, we'll, stop, we'll stop halfway through and then at the end for questions, um, but feel free to type them as they come into your head rather than feeling like you've got to wait for the, for the typing bit. Um, Obviously the, quest, the webinar has been recorded um, and it will be available on our website from Monday at the latest for you to be able to watch it again or for, um, or for you to recommend it to other people to watch later as well. Um, and then finally, or a couple of other things, there's a silver line on your screen, probably you can move that left or right to make Simon and us um, smaller or larger and the slides smaller or larger. And then finally, right at the very end, we'll mention this again at the end, there'll be a quick questionnaire just for us to get some feedback from you guys, which is always really helpful. Um, and just to say, we're aware that there's a slight bit of feedback going on, but we've experimented. And when Thea and I both mute ourselves and Simon talks, it seems to go away. So hopefully that will happen in just a moment. So I'm gonna hand over to um, Simon Composer, um, who's a fabulous horseman, um, who was recommended to me by Sue Dyson some months ago. Um, and since meeting him, we've had a fan fantastic journey in terms of learning about core conditioning for horses. So I'm going to let Simon introduce his background to you a little bit more. Um, but that's it from us. So thank you very much, Simon. We're going to leave it over to you. Well, thank you, Heidi. That's a really, really kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, friends old and new, um, wherever you're watching from, home, work, prison, the future, welcome. Um, so today we're going to talk about the horse's core and how we can train the horse's core, what it is, how it works, why it's so important, and, um, and, and sort of more importantly, what you can practically do for your horse's core very easily as part of your everyday riding program. Um, a little bit about my background, I was British trained and German trained classically. Um, I've been a, uh, an examiner for the French Equestrian Federation for the last 10 years. And uh, now I focus on biomechanics, particularly what the horse does with the spinal column when we're not riding them and what happens when we are riding them and how to improve this for them. Um, so shall we go on to the first slide? Okay, so... This is one of my favorite pairs, and the reason I wanted to show these two um, to you is because I believe Edward Gow and his lovely horse, Zonic, really do display harmony. Now, harmony is something we don't talk about very often when we're riding, but it is an extremely important premise uh, under the FBI rules, Article 401, I think. Harmony has to be the goal. It has to be the pinnacle, and everything we do shouldn't really compromise that goal. Now, how do we achieve harmony? We really need to condition the horse's body so we can ride softly and they can move freely. Where does this begin? It begins in the most important part of the horse's body, which is the spinal column. As we all know, when we have a problem with our back, the rest of us doesn't work. It's the same with the horse. And okay, I agree, these two are top class. They're, 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 they're the best in the world uh, to some extent. So it's, I'm not suggesting that we all aim for dressage at the same level as Edward Gow and uh, Zonic. Um, but I do think that 
visualizing the harmonious coupling of a human and horse really does give us somewhere to go, some, something to aim for. So just have a look at these two and how they move together. This horse is in a wonderful elevated trot and the rider is soft, still, and in the middle. This is only possible if certain components are correct. And we're gonna talk about one of the major ones today, the horse's core. Okay, shall we go on to the next slide? Right, so what is the horse's core? The spinal column is the foundation of the horse's body. All the other bits, the legs, the head, the neck, rib cage, all attached to the spinal column. So why is that important? It's important because the entire system of bones is, is, is a joint together with joints, joints that can move, which means that this foundation, this skeleton is effectively bendy and flexible. So unlike our cars, which have a rigid chassis, when we sit in a car, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't change the way the wheels are configured. But when we sit on a horse, we actively and dynamically change the angles in the skeleton and particularly the spinal column. So I think when we are riding and training our horses and also looking for solutions to our horses issues or training development, we really do have to be focusing on the integrity and thorough efficiency of the spinal column because it is the root of everything else that comes with the horse's movement. So if we could move on to the next slide. So that was the hardware. The red stuff is the software. It's the muscles. So attached to the spinal column, we have an extremely complicated network of muscles that have to work in harmony. They have to work as an orchestra. If the spinal column isn't moving as it should, completely freely, without restriction, the muscles can't do their job. And to some extent, if the muscles can't act properly on the skeleton, we have a change in movement. And how the horse interprets this is in difficulty. So then we lose the opportunity of having something called harmony because the horse will become crooked, the horse will not use certain parts of his body, and we really need, if we're going to have a happy athlete, um, not only the skeleton, but also the musculature working together in unison as per the wonderful design that nature gave us. So again, when we're riding and when we're uh, uh, training our horses, we have to constantly focus on what is going on underneath us inside the horse's body, because that's where the answers lie. Shall we move on to the next slide? I mean, just a, just a quick question. Does it matter about the horse's conformation or is, is that the same theory no matter the horse? Okay, very important point. I see it as two different things. We have posture and conformation. So of course, conformation cannot be changed, but posture obviously can be optimized to its maximum ability. So it doesn't really matter if we're talking about Sonic from the video or our horse with a less illustrious bloodline. We have what we have, they are what we are. Our job is to, uh, to, to change the horse's posture. So their job is as easily, as easy and as pleasant as possible without causing them any physical harm. So confirmation will probably determine the outcome of paces and physical ability, but it is not related to the horse's efficiency and posture. Okay, so now we're onto this interesting video. This horse doesn't move very well at all, but then I suppose it's a surprise it can move at all without any muscles. So this is a very good graphic of the skeleton in motion at gallop. So as we can see, if we, when we, it'll cycle through again. As we can see from the skeleton, the, the horse's back has to flow 
it has to flow in motion because if a part of it, and very commonly some, an area, the area of the, the thoracolumbar region between the withers and the croup, if any of the back is compromised along that section, whether it be through bone or muscular asymmetry or, 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 or any um, tension or restriction, and we won't get this lovely flow through the spinal column and that lack of movement goes down through the horse's limbs. And of course, this is where we find our horses have their idiosyncratic ways that seem to sort of hang around. They are based in the efficiency of the spinal column and its musculature. So we must bear in mind that although we can look at a picture uh, of, of a horse's anatomy, this thing moves, everything moves. It has to move. And when bits of it don't, then we experience that negatively from the saddle. Wonderful, thank you to one of the ugliest horses in the world uh, in that video. Okay, should we move on? Now, as a contrast, this is a very interesting video because this is an Arab stallion. And interestingly enough, this Arab stallion is not written. So he is using his natural ability and natural instinct in movement to propel himself. Now, we'll watch this video as it cycles through. He naturally arches his neck, naturally rises through the back and gets a kind of chewing gum elevation through the front end. And what we're, try and what we're trying to do when we train our horses to carry us is show them that they can do this. That if they carry their back high and they use their internal core musculature to keep their spine optimized and lifted, then they can carry themselves and us much more efficiently. Now, what is interesting, and I'd like to, you to, to, to look at in this video, is the way the horse naturally stretches his head forward and down. Now, he's doing this because it makes the lifting mechanism through the back much more efficient. But you can see in the beginning of the video, when it breaks and he cycles at the beginning there, he has an upward and outward aspect of the head and neck, with a vertical face. So what we are trying to achieve in classical dressage is really the horse's natural, excited, and most athletic state. So we have to train the horse specifically so they can produce this because they don't necessarily do it naturally like this chap does, but then we, further than that, we have to train the horse to do it when we're sitting on them. And of course, we're sitting in just the wrong place to get that job done. So. This is why core work is so important. So please bear in mind that here's a natural athlete. You may feel that your horse isn't a natural athlete. That doesn't mean you can't train him or her to be the best they can be and move like this horse does naturally. Okay, that was interesting. Should we move on? Okay, in contrast, here's a horse with lots of problems. Please excuse the resolution of the video, it's not terribly clear. But this, I know this horse, um, it's a kissing spine case. If you look at him uh, carefully, you'll see that the rider has lost control, really, of the horse's posture. So as a result, any rearward action that the rider makes with the rein just brings the horse's head further underneath because the head and neck is no longer influenced by the by the back the back is having its own problems so the horse compensates for this by curling more in front and of course then you lose the properties of the contact you lose the fact that you cannot stretch the horse forward otherwise you lose control if you look at the tail swishing like a propeller this is, these are all signs that the horse is having trouble. But also, if you look carefully at the limbs, you'll find he changes behind quite often in the canter. So it's disunited and then correct and a little bit of a buck and a lift. These are all signs that the horse is having a lot of trouble just basically doing a circling canter with the rider on board. So between the Arab horse that you just saw and this horse, 
try to uh, picture how we could turn this one into the one we saw previously. And that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. Lovely. Okay, should we go to the next slide? Okay, so on a, uh, on a basis of biomechanics, essentially what we're trying to do when we optimize the horse's uh, spinal angle is shorten the baseline. So we're trying to bring the front legs under the horse's chest directly and the hind legs further under the horse's body so those big muscles at the back can take the majority of the weight of the quarters and the torso, very heavy things. So of course, the lower the back, as you can see in the lower graphic, the lower the back, the higher the head carriage, the further the front legs have to go uh, forward to stabilize the front end and the hind legs stick out the back, which means that the pelvic angle is rotated in a way where the horse cannot bring his hind legs underneath his torso and take weight. So law of levers, I'm sure you remember that from school, if the back is not high, the pelvis can't curl under and the horse can't sit. So this is why we have to focus on the green arrow in the top graphic about somehow lifting the horse's spine under you. And at the same time, toning the internal musculature of the horse so they can sustain this in motion while carrying us. It's easy, it sounds complicated, but it isn't. Okay, should we move on? <laughs> Okay, so this is a very interesting graphic, much it describes the same principle as the, 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 the pictures before. So we really can see that this flexible spinal column, um, whatever happens to the spine, happens to the limbs too, but you get an accentuation of the movement through the limb because they're further away from the source. So even a slight dip in the thoracic section under that green and red. Uh, arrow on top of the horse will have a profound effect on the way the horse stands, his posture, and what he can do to distribute and alter for the better his own body weight. Fantastic. So where are we? Okay, so I think we're into the questions section now, are we? Yeah, we are. And we, we pinpointed the questions here to be specifically around the, the sort of the biomechanics and the engineering of the horse rather than the riding piece, because we're going to come on to the riding in the next section. So if anybody's got any specific questions around how that this, this, the structure of the horse um, works and, and the biomechanics, then this is the time to start typing those specifically. <coughs> so... Um, and as we do, I think we've got one question. I'm not sure if it needs spinal mechanics. Let me just double check. Um, okay, we've got a question, um, thanks from Michelle, um, but it's specifically about riding. So I think we might leave that one until afterwards. Um, so you've been through some various training and, and now the horse is uncomfortable. So we'll come back to that one when we've talked about the riding piece, Michelle. Um, Lorraine, so Lorraine says, if your horse naturally has a high head carriage, but then back dips its back, can you help? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, because when the horse has a high head carriage, I mean, I like to, to, to look at the horse, the way the horse moves in two, in, in two different ways. Uh, there's an incorrect way and a correct way. And it really is sort of fairly black and white. It's either efficient or it isn't. When a horse has a high head carriage, what I tend to find is that they have a sort of chicken movement where sort of a chicken when it walks, it brings its head up and back, nods forward. Where uh, when the horse is working correctly through the back, it's the opposite. It walks more like a cat. So the head go, bobs forward and down as, as the cat walks. And I think that what we have to uh, bear in mind is that if you have a horse with a high head carriage and a low back, it's probably a good idea to start isolating the, the back and stretching the horse out to try and lift the back and lower the head and neck because moving more like a cat is much better for the horse in the long term and obviously 
any restriction that the horse may have an inefficiency with the low back is going to interfere with training and uh, and ultimately what your horse can, can do. So yes, I mean, definitely. If you find that your horse has a high head carriage and a low back, core work is just what he or she needs. We can't just stop the interference there. We, talk, we talked about um, the, um, the horse's, horse's confirmation and some horses naturally have their heads put on higher on their, or it appears to be higher on their body, don't they? Whereas some horses, their heads are naturally lower. So what would, how would you interact differently or what difference does that make, would you say? I think that they are just points on the same graph because the template is the same, of course, with confirmation, if you take the skeleton of a cob and the skeleton of a, of a thoroughbred, the, 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 the bones are going to be different lengths, the distribution is different, the body balance is different. So yes, there are aspects that, that well, there are limitations to within the design, but that doesn't change the fact that um, the musculature reflects the way the horse moves. So, even when we look at a horse that appears to have a naturally high head carriage, what we'll often find is that the muscles on the top line are very weak. And when we start to change the horse's posture for the better, where they can lift their back and build the lifting muscles of, across the top line, that their entire shape changes. That isn't confirmation. That's muscle distribution. So I think we had to... When we're looking at a horse, we have to say, is this horse evenly muscled? Because if, okay. if it isn't evenly muscled and the baseline muscles, the lower muscles that say the shoulders and the bum and the muscle under the neck are more developed than the muscles along the top of the horse's body, it's not a conformational issue. So it can be changed completely. And then of course the horse will look like a different horse. They do, they look, like a completely different breed, in fact, when they're yeah. muscled properly. Interesting. Okay. Um, a question from Claire. So does the head very low, say for instance when it's eating hay, I guess naturally, help the back come up? So when it's in that kind of relaxed state? I'm sorry, can you say that? So when the, um, does the head being very low, so for instance when it's eating hay or grass, help the back come up? Or does it have to be in, in work, I guess is the question. Right, okay, so that's an interesting question. The, the horse's body is designed to eat grass 18 hours a day. Grass isn't very nutritious, so they need lots of it. And what that means is that the body is designed to be balanced with the nose on the ground. Um, just standing, obviously they can all do. But what I have found is that when they, if they can learn to hold the grazing posture while in motion, obviously slowly at first, gradually building up the strength, what this does is this isolates the lifting mechanisms that we were just talking about and, you, uh, and, and, and strengthens the top line. And gradually they start to be able to sustain a low grazing position and move themselves. And this is what gives them the coordination and the musculature in the core. And the thing about it is it's extremely natural because of course the horse is designed to do it in the first place. But yes, it has to be emotion, just being static. There's, there isn't enough dynamic energy to employ the core muscles to lift the back if the horse isn't moving. Brilliant, thank you. And um, we've got one here from Helen. Can I ask where the spine is more mobile and where it is more fixed, naturally? Ah, right. Okay, that's a good question. Well, obviously, the, the, the part of the horse's uh, spine that is, and is that, is that Helen Chandler? I bet it is. She's fantastic. She always comes up with good questions for me. Um, yeah, so the, obviously the most mobile part of the spine is the neck, because the neck bones, the, uh, the cervical vertebra, they, they can move in all three directions. So they can round, they can flex, and they can rotate. Um, the thoracic section, I, I feel, has the least movement, but it's the longest. So being longer, you do get 
you can achieve bend throughout the system. Um, but, uh, and that's where horses usually suffer the most because it's the longest part. So yeah, I would say the most movement is in the thoracic, is in the uh, cervical and the neck and the least is in the thoracic section. Great, thank you. We'll go into a bit more de detail in a minute. We've got a, a graphic and I'll just tell you uh, in the next section where, uh, how each section moves of the spine. So, so we'll, we'll go into that. And then I think the fits in this section we had from Beth, the same question as Michelle, but from the other end, what about when you have a bum high horse, for example, a quarter horse? Okay, right. Now, that's an interesting question. Of course, it's, it's a very good one. Um, sometimes when the horse is hollow in the back and the pelvis is rotated to, towards the exterior of the horse, the hocks straighten. And I find that the inability to sit whether it be at standstill or in motion, is heavily dependent upon the rotative angle of the pelvis. So I do find that, okay, you know, some horses would be conformationally group high, in which case you have to strengthen the front end to be able to lift it to try and bring the horse level. Perfectly possible. My best horse, Wallace, he's in the book, he, he's group high. His, his thoracic section actually takes a dive like this when you see him standing on the arm. So what I've done is I've strengthened the front end so he's got more bounce in front and that allows the back end to come underneath as long as we can get the coordination and timing right. Um, so you have to work with what you've got. You can strengthen any part of the horse's body to compensate for a fault, it's easily done. And also, as the horse gains athleticism, and in, in your horse's case, which you may feel the bum is too high, but if, if you can alter the posture and optimize it and bring the hocks underneath the horse, that will lower the quarters. The more the horse sits down because they feel able to, through the back, sit down, your horse will level up in motion. It's all possible because it's all flexible. Fantastic, thank you, Simon. Um, another one that links into the biomechanics. Um, is it possible to work with an older horse to improve its biomechanics? And we had that one by email as well, so two people will ask the same question. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Is it possible to work with an older horse to improve its biomechanics? Yes, and I actually think it's necessary because the thing is with older horses is they may start to show signs of wear and tear. Now, wear and tear is often focused on the part of the body that is struggling the most. You know, we see in a lot of older horses, things like navicular. Navicular is a degenerative uh, disease of the surface of the navicular bone where the, uh, ten the tendon runs across it. So it's like a pulley. So there's a lot of tension on it anyway. Now, if the horse is on the forehand, that increases the pressure on the navicular bone and that's where it can't cope. So, in the interest of an older horse, optimizing their posture and, and making their, the, the way the horse move, moves more efficient is, is probably more important because you want longevity. So we need to distribute the forces around the body by making the body more efficient in motion. So definitely. What I do tend to do with older horses is try to remain sensitive to the struggles that they're already uh, under. I mean, if they're flying around the field and they're fit, I would treat it like a five-year-old. But if you've got a horse that has existing problems, just there's all sorts of things we can do to sort of minimize the stress on those existing problems while gently targeting them to make the supporting structures that alter that aspect of them better. So yes, the answer is definitely. I do it with 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and in fact, my 30 year old inventor was fit as a fiddle because his core was strong and all his limb issues really disappeared in his 20s because he got better at carrying himself. And, you know, it's sort of 25%, 25% on each foot. And of course, that limits the amount of wear and tear that the horse will experience in the limb. So, yeah, very important for an older horse. 
Fantastic. Um, just one, one which I think will link into the, the next section, and then I think we'll probably move on to the next section and then gather all as many questions as we can at the end. So um, a question from Fiona. Um, you've talked about the upward and forwards flexibility. Is the sideways flexibility is important? The classical instructor told me the flexibility is only from the neck, but this doesn't seem right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll address the movement of the spine in a, in, in a slide that's coming up. Yeah. I remember being told this as well, that the, uh, the, 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 the horse's spine doesn't bend. Now, I think, I think it depends how far back you go with traditional equitation, because of course, before we had MRI scanners, it was a bit difficult to, to, to tell what was going on. You, you, you had to rely on some autopsy and dissection. But I think what is important to remember is there are two aspects. So the horse's spine, uh, every part of it must move to a greater or lesser extent, depending on which part it is. But also, when we sit on them, if the core isn't strong enough, we change those angles. Yeah, so we, we um, maybe make it move more than it's designed to do. And, and you know, we're, it's something that we, we may talk about at another time is kissing spine. And of course, kissing spine is a direct result of exceeding the angle, the natural angle of the way the vertebrae interact with each other until bones touch. So that would be um, a flexibility that it's not designed for. Nevertheless, um, when you have, there is movement throughout the spine uh, in the cervical, thoracic and lumbar area. They move differently, but they do move. And even if it's only a little, when you get a chain, like a, like a bicycle chain, a little movement with all of them means a big movement overall. And then, of course, when you take that movement and you filter it down to the limb, it's massive. So, yes. The whole spine is as flexible as ours is between the pelvis and the ears, without a doubt. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Let, let's crack on and then we'll come back to, to questions as we get nearer to the end. That's OK. Terrific. OK, so the core muscles. So yeah, as you can see, it's a network. Um, we have the abdominals in pink, we have the iliopsoas in green, we don't have the multifidus, which is underneath the spine. Interesting, the, interestingly enough, the, the multifidus, it lies underneath the spine and there are more nerve endings coming out of the multifidus than there are coming out between the, uh, between the vertebra. So this is a, there's a, a, a huge feedback between the way that the spine is moving and the musculature, which feeds through the core. So whatever's happening with your hind legs or with your forelimbs or with the neck is all going through a processor, through the horse's brain, through the spine, out through the multifidus and all the nerves and distributing around the horse's body. So our job is to make this network work as smoothly as a circle so it feeds back nothing but positivity and this is where we get improved movement and a happier horse so bear in mind because of the depth of these muscles obviously you can see the the abdominal muscles on the outside of your horse but most of them are very very deep in the horse therefore very very hard to get to which is why you can't massage them inject them can't even operate on them the only way to influence the horse's core muscles is by gradually asking the horse to employ them. So building the strength from within. And only when the horse is strong within will we get strength and efficiency on the exterior. And I think it's important to remember that even if we stand in front of the horse, we see this big bum and these big shoulders and all this muscle mass. These ones are the important ones. And they're important in the sense that they will dictate what the big muscles on the outside do. So that should be the focus. And when we get this right, the stuff on the outside starts to work right too. Okay, should we move on to the next slide? Okay, so the end result 
is we get a lifting through the spinal column into you, the rider. So you are sitting on something that is pushing upwards into you, therefore making your job easier because you're not being thrust into the air and then left as the spine drops. It make uh, it, when the horse is using its back and lifting through the back, you can sit very easily in the trot. This is what we saw Edward Gow doing on Zonic at the beginning. As a result, because it, again, again, it's a circuit, it's a chain, the pelvis can rotate further underneath, bringing the stifle, the hocks, and then ultimately the, the hind feet under the horse's center of gravity, and the cycle continues. Then it pushes back up again into the spine. So the stride has this cyclic positivity of upward thrust engagement. And of course, one look at the horse's body shows you that the biggest muscles are in the bum. So that has to be the carrying end of the horse. They have to be employed. Otherwise, we are all destined to ride a horse on the forehand with 70% of their body weight on the front legs, something that we absolutely have to avoid because it, as we mentioned earlier, it wears them out. So this graphic is very important. This is what we're trying to achieve. Now, the difference between core work and classical dressage is in classical dressage, we would balance the, the, the horse's driving impulsion into a restraining half halt contact. Now, that works very well if you're dealing with a horse that is a physically perfect specimen, because of course, as you push, the back end comes underneath the horse's body, the back lifts, and then you can give a lovely contact and, and sort of connect the horse. But if the horse's back is not ideal, it's, the core is not strong enough, and you haven't got this lovely flow of energy, this circuit of energy, then driving the back end into a half halt has no effect. I think we, we all know what that feels like. When you know we're, we're, we're trying to push the horse forward and we're trying to shape the front end, but it feels blocked. It's not organic, it's not flexible. This is what we're after. And I think it really helps to, to have this picture in mind of what we're trying to achieve. And the best way of doing it is by strengthening the internal co components of the horse until this happens on its own. And in fact, much of what we're doing with the core is to help the horse be sufficiently strong and efficient that we don't have to help them anymore. Because if you have to help your horse balance, then the horse has no balance. Because on board, we, we can't really influence the horse's balance because we're part of the balance problem. We're sitting closer to the front end than the back end. And of course, if the horse isn't sitting, it, we're really making the job harder. So um, I think it's, it's important to bear in mind that by strengthening the core muscles, this happens on its own and you don't need to then intervene in your horse's movement. The horse already can carry themselves and then can learn to carry you. Wonderful, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so um, I use long and low. Now, long and low taken to the extent that I want to see it, I call forward, down and out. So this graphic is of course moving in that direction. Now, why is this important? It's important because with the intrinsic nature of carrying a human being on their back, we tend to be part of the tension circuit, part of the restriction through the spinal column. So one of the most important things we can do is teach the horse, as, as we mentioned earlier in the question, to stretch out, to elongate the top line, to make it as long as possible, much as a dancer would, sit on the floor and stretch by placing the head on the knees. I mean, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we can all achieve that, I think. It's a question of having enough flexibility through the musculature. So um, if we look at this graphic, what we ideally want the horse to do is to realize for themselves, not because we have taught them anything, but we've just shown them where it is, to tighten through the abdominals, to tighten also and strengthen the iliocerus, which is the light green muscle, 
Underneath the spinal column, you can, it's at the same color, unfortunately, but the red section would be the uh, multifidus. These all need to be toned in condition, short, tight, and responsive. They have to be able to let go as much as they contract and work in orchestra with each other. It's in this shape that the horse learns to do that. Lovely, should we move on? Okay, here we go. This is the one we were looking for. All right, so the horse has seven cervical vertebrae, 18 thoracic vertebrae, and six lumbar. The, as we discussed earlier, the cervical vertebrae can move in three directions, upward, lateral, and rotation. The thoracic section, which, um, for which the ribs are attached, because they contain the organs, the lungs, and the heart and the digestive system, they, um, they don't move very much, as we said earlier, but they do move laterally. This is so the, uh, the internal organs don't get compressed. So you, you, you only have uh, minimal lateral flexion through the thoracic section. But obviously, because there are 18 of them, if you look at a horse bending one way from above, there is a definite curvature, lateral curvature through that thoracic section. But they, it cannot lift. The lift comes from the musculature around the shoulders and around the rib cage. That's where you get lift in front. So the horse can't technically round their back. They can only lift it. Obviously, the reverse can happen if, as we said earlier, if a horse has a kissing spine, then there is an unnaturally low flexion in the back through the force of the rider. Um, so that obviously is where the problems occur because it's not meant to operate at those angles. But anyway, the thoracic, thoracic section has lateral flexion only. The lumbar section doesn't have any lateral flexion because it's taken care of by the thorax, but it does have rotative and rounded. So it can, it can move upwards and it can twist. The lumbar section, even though it's quite short, is really the gearbox of the horse's body. This is the, the set, it's very strong and it connects the front of the horse to the powerful back end. And I do find that whatever's happening in the thoracic section, it's lumbar efficiency really does have a huge effect on the way the horse can mobilize. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about one exercise that I love that targets the lumbar area. Uh, 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 which you know is a turnabout forehand. Um, and it really isolates this section and gets it moving. Lovely, let's move on. So, when I start with a horse, I like to decompress the spine. I feel that much as a, as a human dancer has hypermobility through stretching, the teaching the horse that they can stretch forward, down and out in motion has a wonderful decompressing effect on the entire top line. Now, when you see a horse that doesn't have a strong top line and has muscle wastage, it only means that the horse isn't using the upper part of its musculature properly. Usually there's some kind of misalignment in size. This fixes it. And it doesn't really matter where in the section that it is, because as we gradually teach the horse to move in FDO, they learn to thrust upwards through their body. And as that happens, it decompresses any muscular tension that may be in the top line, and also decompresses any spinal processes that might be a little close and causing maybe the odd twinge or even quite a lot of pain if it becomes advanced. So teaching the horse to walk, trot, and eventually canter in this forward, down, and out position, it's the place to start because the horse immediately feels the benefits of stretching the back and using the core. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So that was the last, FDO is a top line stretch. This is a lateral stretch. So obviously what we have to do as well, it, we're working the horse in three dimensions, right? This is a moving creature. It's a system with incredible flexibility when it's organized. 
So of course we have to evoke these movements in our train. So once we've decompressed the top line, we also have to decompress the outside of the horse. And so a lot of my exercises use more bend than we would usually use in, a, a, in dressage, if you would like, because what we're trying to do is extend the current limit of the horse's flexibility in those three dimensions. Only then will the horse be able to use its body fully and feel free. So this is an example of the kind of lateral flexion that I would like to see through a horse's body where they can flex inwards completely free, free of restraint. Okay, let's move on. So ultimately, what do we end up with? We hopefully end up with the horse on the left. So we have a horse that has the flexibility to not only bend around the corner uniformly, so the spinal column, the energy travels through the spinal column evenly. This will mean that the horse can maintain a 25, 25, 25, 25 weight distribution while going around the corner. And if they can do that, they'll be able to do it in a straight line too. If we look at the graphic on the right, and this is something we commonly see, if you look at the uh, thoracic section, it's straight. In other words, the horse is locked up there and it's turned into a rod. This means that all the energy that comes from the thrust coming from the back end of the horse gets thrown through the outside shoulder. Now, the horse has two ways of coping with this. They either fall out or they throw their weight to the inside to go around the corner like a bicycle where they're leaning in. The horse on the left won't need to do it. The horse on the left can go around the corner like a train, remains upright and goes around the corner. The horse on the right will have to, will, you will find he will fall out on one rein and he will fall in on the other rein. It's not his fault, he's not being disobedient, can't do anything else because his back is locked and he needs his back to operate efficiently. Okay, let's go to the next one. So when we achieve suppleness in three dimensions throughout the entirety of the horse's body, we can then move on to the next section, which is coordination. So if we have a horse that it hasn't been moving efficiently and we use release exercises to decompress the system, what do we do with it then? Well, what do we have to do is we have to teach the horse to use their body in a larger range of motion, both in a forward sense, upward sense, and lateral sense, and then master this coordination. Now, if the horse has been blocked for a while, what we find is the, 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 the lateral steps and the forward steps tend to be short. They can be rushed, but they'll be short, and they'll be out of balance. So when we liberate the horse's body with releasing exercises, and then move forward into coordination exercises, the horse can learn then not to, you know, hit itself with its own legs, fall forwards, they can learn to sit, they can learn to go sideways, and they can learn to manage their own body weight, and it'll be stable because the limbs are not only free, but coordinated. So I like this picture because, as you can see, this horse is a highly coordinated animal. He's got thrust, engagement, and lateral activity. Look at the parallels between the front and hind limbs on both sides. Obviously this horse has been trot. And look at the stability of the body. The body is absolutely upright and straight. Everything is moving as it should. And the, this horse is obviously rotating, rounding, and flexing through the spine, allowing the limbs to do this while remaining in perfect balance. There's a lot to like about that picture. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so we are trying to employ the horse's natural core power. So the power is there, they're all designed with it. So we need the horse to lift through the thorax. We need the horse to push up under the spine with the abdominals and core, and we need the pelvis to rotate so the horse can get his inside highness. This one is, under the center of gravity, take the weight and push forward and upward. So this is really our, our ideal. 
is to employ these three different flexible and changeable aspects of the way the horse carries himself. And when he can do it himself, it'll happily carry you on top uh, and remain in balance because he has access to the facility of his own body. So our core work is really to give the horse access to what is already within him. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is one of my favorite exercises. I'm gonna show you a couple of the exercises from my book. Um, this is the Jura Volta, this is exercise number 10. So this is a, a lunging exercise. Now, if you have a horse that has a back problem or you don't have a saddle, or the horse is maybe a little bit dangerous, um, or really so unbalanced that it just feels terrible to ride, this is the exercise to go to because you can fix a lot on the lunge. Now, the Gira Volta is teaching the horse to flex laterally through the body and flex vertically through the spinal column. Now, the further towards the ground the nose gets, the more th upward thrust you get through the thorax, through the abdominal region, and then obviously the, the, uh, the, the pelvis rotates and the hind legs come underneath. It takes a little while for the horse to learn to do this efficiently, but I do it in a very slow trot, so there's not a lot of wear and tear or stress on the horse's body. And it's amazing when you get the angles right, how the horses just put themselves in this shape and learn to balance. Now, once the horse has learned to balance in this way on their own, you've got a 500% chance of riding it in more balance too, because he can balance himself on a circle without you. If your horse can't bounce on a circle without you, they haven't got a chance of bouncing with you on top. So I use this, ex this is my go-to exercise and my favorite. Okay. Simon, we had a question um, in the previous section, which probably relates here, which is, um, how do you balance forward, uh, for forward down stretch with not falling on the forehand? So th I think this is a good demonstration, isn't it? Yeah, this is a demonstration. And there's, a, there's a technical reason for that. Right now, um, the horse has something called the neutral ligament, which runs from the ears to the pelvis. It's essentially, uh, it's like a rope of collagen. And what happens is it, it has laminae, which are attached just at the base, uh, at the top of the neck, at the lowest point in front of the withers. The laminae are attached from this neutral ligament to the front of the thoracic vertebra. Now, the lower the horse's head gets, the tighter the neutral ligament becomes, and the, this manually lifts the thorax between the shoulder blades. So it's very important to remember that the horse's front legs are only attached to the body with muscle. Uh, so they don't have a clavicle like we are, we do. So their shoulder has an extreme range of motion when it's trained. So as the horse lowers the head and the neutral ligament tightens and lifts, it manually lifts the front of the spine between the shoulder blades and brings the horse into a better balance than they were with the head up. If a horse is in, out of balance on the forehand when their nose is low like this, um, well, it means that they were out of balance with the head up too. So by practicing this, it, because of the neutral ligament, it will bring the horse into balance. Although I do understand why it looks like the horse may go forwards, but you must remember that you've got 150 kilos of head and neck sticking out the front. It's sticking out the front, whether it's down or up, it's still sticking out the front. So we're going to use the head and neck and its ability stretch down to lift the back because of this neutral ligament and its laminate. But it's a very good question and everyone asks it. <laughs> Right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the, um, the human equivalent of the Gira Volta is the, uh, this yoga revolved half moon. Now, what is interesting about this human that is doing it, she can demonstrate what we're trying to achieve very well. So revolved half moon is involves bringing the hind limb underneath 
the main body weight. So the, the, the yoga lady here has got her leg, she's standing on one leg and it's under her central mass. And what she's doing is she's twisting through the spine to place her left arm underneath her shoulder weight in a rotative manner. When we do the Jura Volta, we have to use a slight inside flexion because this creates this effect where the, uh, the, shoulder, the outside shoulder is coming around the circle and the body weight is being taken by the inside height. So there's a rotation, a twist, all at the same time. So we have lateral flexion and we have rotative flexion. Now it's not for us to decide how the horse interprets that. What we do is we set this exercise up until they discover that if they release, let go and allow, they can achieve this. So the yoga equivalent is good because we see a static version of what we're trying to achieve with the horse in motion in Jira Volta. Simon, I'm just going to add another question that I've noticed that links in with this section as well, I think. So um, I think you've explained some of it just now, but there might be some extra you could add. <clears throat> how do you teach the horse to understand what they should do? I.e., how do you ask it to lower its head as my young horse on the lunge is head up and out towards the outside of the circle? Yeah, that's very common. And in that graphic that we saw with the two horses uh, from above, um, when the horse loses its balance and falls to the inside, through the inside shoulder, the head goes to the outside. And it's something you see young stock doing. It's very natural. It ju it's just an untrained way of going. You know, we're the same. We have to be trained to be dancers. Most horses have to be trained to be dancers too. So what happens is, is with your horse that is falling through the inside shoulder and the head comes up and to the outside, this is why we have to teach the horse to go around a circle with an inside flexion in shoulder in. Because what happens there is we are manually aligning the horse's spine for him. He doesn't know what optimal is. They're creatures of habit, creatures of instinct. They haven't seen any of the books or DVDs. So they're just gonna wing it. When we can teach the horse to flex inwards, they suddenly experience the graphic that we saw with the two horses from above with the green background, where they are flexed around the corner. When they feel this, they feel the alignment in their spine that they probably haven't experienced before because it's not their habit to work like this. The horse naturally feels the alignment and stretches their, their nose to the ground. It happens completely naturally because it is natural. But the fact is the horse doesn't know how to align themselves to achieve it. But as soon as we show them, they, they go straight to it. Because of course, there's no way of teaching your horse to stretch his nose and sat. It has to come from them. And they all do it once we show them where this alignment is. That's really, uh, I would say our primary role when we're dealing with horses is to show them what is biomechanically best for them and say, you know, try this out. And of course, if we get them to try it, they'll adopt a better, more efficient, more comfortable way of going immediately. Yeah, and from experience, I think that's the interesting thing is it's, it's more angle to the inside than you think to begin with, so that they get the opportunity to find their place by, I guess, moving in and, and slightly back out again. Yeah, that's definitely true. And also I find that horses learn to do the top line stretch first and then when you introduce the angle a bit more they start to struggle uh, because it's much easier for them to remain not flexed laterally and stretch out first and it's good because it's a decompression of the top line but then when you start to introduce the inside flexion and I think this is why most people don't go there when they're playing at, at, with the horse because bring the nose in and it all crashes because of course the horse has no exterior flexibility. And, and, and also what we're often fighting, and, and the, the, this question is related to, to, to our, our, our viewer, is that when the horse locks up through the back, they don't do it evenly. They often get tighter on the more dominant side. Now horses like humans are 90% right-handed. So when they get tense in the back, the right hand side usually blocks up. And what this means is when you try and bend your horse left, 
they can't let go on the outside. So it becomes even more important to show them that if they can bend in and let go on the outside of their body, then they can bend through the back and then they can relax not only on the exterior of their back, but also through the top line. Okay, should we go to the next slide? Right, so here's the horse doing the, um, the yoga pose. So as you can see, I'm bringing the horse's nose around the circle with the lunge line and bringing the shoulder around the circle too. The back end, well, that's, that's up to the horse to sort out. We're showing the horse where that alignment is. And here Wallace has got a very slight inside flexion because he's quite good at this exercise, but it, I'm allowing the outside of the horse to become one uniform curvature. And then as you can see, you've got the inside hind that is just left the ground and it's coming forward and it's gonna go right under his belly, take the weight and push off. So we are bending, curving, releasing and stretching all at the same time, which is why the Giravolta lunge is an absolute staple. And every horse really should learn how to walk, trot and canter in balance with their nose in FDO, ideally. Great stuff. Okay, let's move on. So in the Giravolta, as I mentioned, the picture on the left, we have a horse that is um, got his head up and he's not bending much, but by increasing the flexion to the inside, all the bones line up in the back and the horse naturally just stretches forward. But again, it shouldn't affect the horse's body balance. This horse, as you can see, is slightly leaning on the left photo and on the right photo as he lowers his nose, the body becomes slightly more upright. Now, obviously, as the, uh, the back decompresses, the body can become totally upright on the circle. So this is a very interesting couple of photographs. To bring that front end round brings the horse into alignment. Thank you. And should we have the next one? Okay, so the... Um, Sorry, Simon, I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna this is a question that kind of links to this before we go on to the next bit, um, which is um, linked to the Jura Volta but being ridden, I guess. So the question is, how can I raise the back in dressage training? Um, the exercises from the ground are super and he can lift his back with stimulation between the front legs very high. So I guess if, um, without the rider, he's doing it. We can do this with the rider as well, can't you? I don't do this with the rider. Um, I do another exercise, which is I do the six meter vaults in a figure of eight, because I think it's really helpful to come through, say, two blocks, or say six meters apart, and change the bend all with the head down, because I think it's very important the horse learns to stay relaxed and stretch through the top line while we change the rein. Otherwise, they tend to bring it up in between and then drop it. So, um, but in fact, this, again, this is teaching the horse to release and straighten, albeit on a curve, a line. But the next exercise I think is one of my favorites for lifting, uh, which is the turn on the forehand. Okay, so uh, turn on the forehand. What we're asking the, do, the horse to do is rotate around the inside fore and describe a large circle with the back end by the inside hind coming forward and across the body, changing the weight from the previous outside hind to the inside hind and then back again. So it creates an opening and closing, lateral opening and closing of the hind limbs. Something that's very, very difficult to do without doing an exercise like this that isolates that one particular movement. Um, so, what I think is important to, to see from this picture is that we are teaching the horse to move laterally with the back end, coordinate the front end, bend through the back, and also gain this all important pelvic control by using the lumbar area as its gearbox. And this exercise really isolates the lumbar section of the horse's back behind my saddle, because the horse cannot do it without learning to rotate through the lumbar vertebrae. So as the horse gains 
ability to stretch forward and under the body, displace the weight from one hind leg to the other. They will also gain the ability to rotate through the pelvis, uh, through the um, lumbar section of the spine, round through the lumbar section of the spine and sit because this exercise insists that they learn how to do it, which of course they all can. But this isolates it and allows us to target this particular part of the back, which is really pretty impossible to reach with any other movement. Can we have the next slide? Okay, so here's a little video of Wallace doing turn about the forehand. So, opening, closing, crossing. It is gaining range of motion, gaining mobility, coordination, and toning the core at the same time. Horse has to employ a number of core muscles to do this efficiently. The abdominals, iliopsoas, and all supportive muscle, musculature around the lumbar area. And if you watch carefully what he does with his pelvis as he goes around. And now we're on the legs. Okay, so we've got legs crossing, coordination, mustn't touch himself. Okay, so now look at the, the back end. You'll see all that motion that is now taking place behind me and in the pelvis. This is something which horses must be able to do. And because this is an exercise that we do in walk, it's all very low impact, very low stress. And if we take it very, very gradually in teaching the horse to be able to do this one step at a time, uh, it's amazing how it changes the horse. And in fact, this exercise is unique in the sense that every time you do it, your horse will feel better afterwards, immediately because it shows the horse how to move through the back more efficiently. And if you get a good turn about forehand, your trot and your canter and your circles after it, immediately after it, will feel better. Better for you and better for your horse. So this is absolute go-to exercise from the ridden perspective. Okay, can we see the next slide? Okay, so the human equivalent is the yoga half split. So here we have our yoga meister with her um, right leg going forward under the body. Obviously the proportions are different between the human and the horse, but nevertheless, the basic design is the same. So as you can see from the yellow arrow, it is deeply affecting the way her pelvis is angled in relation to the rest of the spine. This is something we're trying to promote in the way our horses move. So as she does this, it stretches the musculature, but also causes the, the, the back to move in a way which is, again, very difficult to reproduce by doing anything else. It isolates, isolates the lower back. And anyone that's tried this, and I have, will know what I mean. <laughs> it, 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 it's stressful on the body if the body's not used to it. But then we're standing, we're walking, we're sitting. We never really isolate the lower back and stretch it. This is the exercise that does that, and it works magic for horses. Great, if we could see the next one. So what we're trying to achieve globally with all of these exercises, and each of the exercises works on one or more of the different sections of the horse's body, either on a muscular uh, basis or on a motility through the spinal column. And this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve what we saw the, uh, that lovely Bay Arab doing when he was dancing in an earlier video. Using the head and neck as a counterbalance, but the head and neck is no longer part of the way the horse moves. It's just sitting there flexibly being held up by the rest of the spinal column because the head and neck will only do what the rest of the back is doing. Um, so in this shot, Wallace's, um, stretching forward and the head is just a weight, it's just a pendulum on the rest of the spinal column. He's pushing upwards through the thoracic sling, so his rib cage is being pushed up every stride by uh, the mobility and strength between the, 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 the shoulders and the horse's body. Again, that's the thoracic sling. The horse is also thrusting upwards 
through the abdominal region, lifting the wither, and his pelvis is rotated in just the right way to just to lower the quarters, as we mentioned, because he's croup high anyway, but you wouldn't think it from this shot. So he's lowering the quarters to engage those hocks and bring that hind leg right under the body. Every horse can do this, croup high, hollow, head up in the air, every horse can learn to do this because it's basic, it's fundamental and it's natural for them. They just need us to show them how. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the next slide, please. And this is what we get. We get a horse that can do yoga better than we can. Uh, this is a joke, please don't try this at home. Fabulous. Um, well, we've got lots of questions rolling in and actually there's a, there's a couple, if I start with the, a couple about working in the circle. So Angela asks, what size is the circle? So what size should you be working at? On the Giravolta lunge? Yeah. Uh, this is that's a good question. We are generally taught to lunge on 20 meter circles. The trouble is, if your horse is not operating efficiently, the further away they get from you, the less you can influence them. And if you look at a horse being lunged on a 20 meter circle, you'll see the quarters coming to the, as the horse moves away from you or moves towards you, uh, you'll see the quarters being held to the inside. This is because it's the only way the horse can cope is by falling around the corner. I use a very, very slow trot on a six meter circle vault because only at this distance can you push the thorax to the outside and bring the nose to the inside. Now I only use that temporarily because once the horse has learned to stretch the outside of the body and the top line, and they're working with their nose in the sand with an inside flexion, of course, then you can make the circle gradually larger and larger and larger and start going up through the gears, adding more impulsion. Um, but initially, low impulsion, maximum flexion and operator influence. So on a six meter circle, you've got a sort of two and a half meter long lunge whip, you've got a lunge line and you can push the body out and bring the nose in to create this shoulder in angle on the lunge. Any bigger than six, it's not possible, you can't do it and the horse will start to triangulate and go crooked. And the trouble with that is every step the horse makes that is crooked makes him more asymmetrical because it actually trains the musculature on one side to do much more than it does on the other side. So breaking this neck habit of crookedness and misalignment is primary because everything you do that allows the horse to be crooked reinforces the crookedness. It makes it stronger. So yes, six meter circle, get the flexion, get the stretch on the outside of the body and the top line, and then you can use bigger circles because you don't need to have such a strict influence because the horse is now straighter on their own. They've learned how to do it themselves. You can let them onto a bigger circle and go up through the impulsion. And I think that links neatly into Carol's um, question. There are people who believe that work on tight circles puts too much strain on joints, etc. I think you've touched on that, but maybe just... Yes, and I appreciate that that's what it might look like. Number one, been doing this a long time, never seen a horse suffer from doing um, six meter volts if the impulsion is low. And you need nothing more than a jog. The trick is to do it on a soft surface if the horse is very, very crooked. But because it's such low impulsion, there isn't a lot of dynamic energy traveling around the horse's body. There's enough to work with so that you can connect the horse and straighten it but I've not found that it's detrimental to the limbs at all. In fact, I think it works the other way because if you've got a horse that is crooked and works crooked for 10 years, this is gonna wear out the horse's legs much, much faster because when the horse is crooked, um, the limbs, which are only designed to work in a straight line, if you pick up your horse's hind leg, all the joints are designed to work in one singular linear plane. 
if the horse's corset is to the inside or the, 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 the skeleton is not efficient and, and the horse isn't tracking correctly and he's triangulating as he's going, this is putting all sorts of lateral forces on the limbs. So when I see horses that break down through the limb, it's because of crookedness and triangulation through the body that wasn't addressed by doing this. If you work your horse on a six meter bolt for about a month in a very, very slow jog trot, they don't suffer for it, but what it does is it aligns them to, the, to an extent that their body will last longer as a result than if you didn't. That's my finding. Great, thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> we'll, link, we'll keep on the, the questions about the exercises. So, um, Lorraine says, can you do these exercises with a horse that's been off work for a year? How long should you do the exercises for? I think it's a really good question. So if, we're, if we, we want to build their core to bring them into work, but where's the balance? Well, I, I would start with the Giravolta lunge because of course it's nice and simple. And I think when a horse hasn't been in work for a while, it's just like if we haven't done any fitness for a while, it can be a bit of a shock to the system. So getting off the horse's back, I always think is the friendliest thing to do because if they're gonna have a bit of a struggle getting fit, then if they've got sort of a weight on their back wobbling around, it just makes life more complicated. So popping them on the lunge and stretching them and conditioning the body at low impulsion, gradually increasing the duration of the lunge, that's perfect, it's fine. So you can start off with five minutes on each rein and maybe add a minute every day and gradually work your way up as the horse gets fitter and stronger and hopefully more flexible at the same time. Um, and where would you work, be working up to in terms of timing for these types of exercises? Okay, that's a good question. Well, let's take the Giravolta as, a, as an example. I find that horses work through three distinct phases when you're lunging the Giravolta. Uh, they come out and they give it a go. That usually lasts four minutes. Then they enter a phase where they are trying to avoid the bed because they feel that the tension in their back is protecting their back. Um, we, we have to negotiate and sort of semi-insist that they give it a try. Just like any sort of rehabilitation, the body is telling the owner of the body, don't do that, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> All right, so we have to produce a sort of very simple version of what we want to have eventually in a small dose, and then gradually ask a little bit more every day. Um, so yeah, I mean, start easy, observe the horse. You, you really want to work the horse, I would say to somewhere on the, towards the upper limit of their comfort zone every day. That's my general rule. We don't want to cross that. We don't want to make it unpleasant for them. But if we want progress and progress, let's face it, physical progress in this sense means a longer, happier life for the horse. So if we want that, uh, we have to ask them to try just a little bit every day. Um, that means not drifting around, not allowing them to do what they want. You have to say, okay, you know, now a little bit more bend, try that out. And if they go, oh, that's a little bit tricky, you just stay there for a while until they start to relax into it. They've got to relax into it. That's the principle of it. It's about relaxation and harmony. So. If you're bringing a horse back from time off, just approach it as you would your own fitness if you suddenly had a crazy idea about doing a marathon or something insane. You'd start with half a kilometer, wouldn't you? And then maybe at the end of next week, do a kilometer. Then you'd watch how much this affected your body. If you're absolutely exhausted, you'd probably stay at that level until you feel better about it before adding the next kilometer. That's really the way to do it. Feel your way in monitor the horse. If they're struggling, back off a little bit. If they're coping with it, ask for a little bit more. You've got to keep asking for progress if you're ever going to get to the final destination of a fit, strong, healthy, mobile, happy horse. Fantastic. I think that links into the next question as well. Um, and I, I really empathise with this. Um, I've done yoga and maybe been asked to get into positions which my body couldn't really do. So the next day I was sore, I've been there. Um, could this happen to a horse? Great question. Yes, it is a good question and it does. And of course, when we are trying to rehabilitate a horse, 
um, we are isolating their weak points. It's just the way it is. The horse can only operate at the upper limit of their weakest area. So it does happen. Um, we get to a point where we're working the horse's weak points and they take it and they get stronger and they get more flexible. But every now and again, uh, they get a little bit fatigued. It's normal. Those muscles probably haven't been used in a very long time and, um, and may have atrophied somewhat. So it's very important to, again, monitor a degradation um, in the work. So I don't, I, I always, again, push to the upper limit of the horse's comfort zone. But if I find that the horse degrades for say two or three successive days, just finds it a little bit harder than the day before, I just give them three days off. And I find that what that does is they come out on that fourth day and I give them an easy day, but it seems to have cleared up. And I've come to the conclusion it's, it's very weak parts of the horse being asked to work. They, get, they do get moments of fatigue, but a little bit of rest just allows, you know, the, the, the sort of the nutrition in the bloodstream to get in there, get lactic acid out, get the dead cells out, build new cells out of amino acids and proteins. And this doesn't take very long, three, four days, and you're back to, to where you were pushing again and they seem to have recovered. And that's something I see regularly. So yeah, don't be afraid, give them a little bit of a rest, pick it up and go ahead. Fantastic, thank you. We've still got questions, but we're thinking we probably need to wrap up soon. Um, there's, a, there's one that's really, from Michelle, that's really quite technical. I think I might be able to give that one to you offline, um, Simon, if that's okay. Um, and then maybe you could, you could answer direct from Michelle. Um, there is a, a question, do you start from, I think this is, is relevant to everyone, uh, would you start the Dura Volta and walk first? You can. Can. It can't do any harm. I do find though, that because the walk is a four time movement with breaks in between each, each section, that it's, it's very difficult to get a sort of cohesive rhythm. But if the horse has been compromised in the back, like there, you're, you're doing a rehab after kissing spine surgery or the horse has kissing spine, yeah, the walk is a great place to start. And I'd probably spend a week or two weeks there um, just to give the horse the idea of what we're trying to do. Of course, if a horse is experiencing problems in the back, last thing we want to do is, is exacerbate them. So yes, walk is a good place to start, but I really do suggest that you pop into a little jog trot as, as soon as you can, because you can't really affect the angle of the horse, the inside flexion, without a tiny little bit of impulsion. And the trot has this and the walk doesn't. So that's, you have to play it by ear, but you want to get into a little trot as quickly as possible, really. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. I think we'll have to stop on the questions there, but it definitely brings home that, well, actually, there's two things to say. One is that we have, we've already talked about doing a kissing spine specific webinar, haven't we? We've got, we've got a couple of questions around kissing spine. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that those people are, let, they know about the next one, which will be about kissing spine probably in the new year. Um, and yeah, and it just definitely shows us that we, we need more of Simon to come back and answer all the rest of the questions. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Simon. And sorry, we haven't got to the end of everybody's questions. We've, we've tried our best to pick, um, pick different ones that have given slightly different perspectives. Um, so thank you very much for, for, um, for fantastic information as always, and really engaging, a really engaging webinar and so many great question, answers to questions as well. Um, just like to quickly, just a, touch on a couple of quickly of things quickly, um, including Simon's contact details, which I'm sure a lot of people will want. Um, but firstly, just to let people know what's coming up next with Horse Tribe, we've got Andrew McLean speaking next week. Um, for those who don't, you know, Andrew, he's an amazing um, expert in um, equine cognition and learning. Um, he's a, a, an academic in, from Australia, um, he's wonderful knowledge of horse behaviour and communication and he's going to speak on his first webinar about speaking horse which is, um, I know it's going to be absolutely fascinating um, and if you come along ask him questions about elephants too because there's, lot, there's lots to know there. Um, then we've got Donna Case who's a, a nutritionist who's going to be speaking about winter feeding tips. Um, so what do we need to be getting, giving our horses during the winter? 
Um, and then again on the 18th, we've got Justine Harrison, who's an equo behaviourist, um, and she's going to do her first webinar talking about understanding and reducing horses' stress. So um, I think, like Andrew, they're all people who are really compassionate in terms of how they manage and deal and understand horses. So I think everybody will love them. Um, and then the important one, the contact details for Simon. Hopefully, Simon, I've got these right. Um, so if you do want to get in touch, um, Facebook page is at um, Visconti Picosa, but you can also search core conditions for horses and the, the Facebook page comes up, um, website there and email as well. So um, Simon, I think you're more than happy for people to get in touch, aren't you? And, um, and you don't you as well, Simon, so just to raise it, to look out for those, and you certainly do want in Shropshire for those that are here who are from Shropshire, you do clinics, so um, yeah, get in touch with Simon. Yeah, Shropshire Rights, get in touch with me, I do them regularly there, um, best thing to do is look at our core conditioning for horses Facebook page because we post all the clinics there, and if you just uh, like the page, then it'll notify you when we get the post. And then just get in touch and book yourself in. It'd be great. But we do them all over England and uh, hopefully in other countries soon too, once we return to normal, whatever that meant. But thank you. Yes, please get in touch. Amazing. Thank you so much. Heidi, you're still on mute. You've done it twice. That's mute bingo. To oh, no. <laughs> We've got lots of messages say thank you, Simon. So just wanted to mention those. So thanks, folks. And as we leave, if you could just quickly fill in the questionnaire for us, we'd be really, really pleased and give us some feedback. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.